We'll be looking and we'll be beginning this morning in the Gospel of John. And we're going to continue with uh, the, the message that I began a couple of weeks ago. Are you satisfied with your experience? Are you satisfied with your experience? We want our lives to be built on the right foundation. We want our doctrine to be right. And you know we've talked about that before. And we work in that, towards that end. But God help us if we ever come to the place in this church where we have the right doctrine and we know what the Bible says about all of these things and we can quote scripture right, left, front, and center and yet our experiences and our lives don't measure up. Then we would be like the Pharisees who knew the Old, the Old Testament, who knew the scriptures, who knew the Pentateuch so well. They could quote everything and yet their lives had no life. Do you remember what Jesus said about them? They had all the doctrine right. And he said, you, Jesus spoke of them and he said, you seek the scriptures so diligently to find these things out. This is in John. And yet you refuse to come to the one who will give you life that you might live, that you might live. And we never want to be that way. We never want to come to that place. God help us that our doctrine and our theology and our experience always measure up. And as we looked a couple of weeks ago, God the Father and God the Son sent God the Holy Spirit into our lives and into our situations and into through to breathe life into the Word of God in our lives that we might not only know about God but that we might know him that we might experience him and we're going to continue this morning talking about this so we turn to John and we're going to begin in John 14 If you have questions about the Holy Spirit, do you know the best place to look? You know where you, most of your doctrine should come? It shouldn't be in 1 Corinthians 13, 12 or 14. Your doctrine of the Holy Spirit should come primarily from what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit in John 14, 15, and 16. And I want us to look at this. We're going to begin here. And this is the night that Jesus is with his disciples he's going he knows that this is the night he's going to be arrested he's going to be betrayed arrested he's going to be brought before the high priest he's going to go through terrible agonies and then he's going to go to the cross and he knows he's going to leave his disciples they have been with him he has been with them for about three and a half years day by day by day and he's getting ready to leave them and so this evening as he prepares to leave them, he has several topics, and I encourage you, you go back and read what Jesus teaches his disciples in those short chapters in John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. He talks about love. He talks about humility and serving, and, and serving one another, and he talks about the Holy Spirit. And he begins to prepare his disciples. Why, some people look at this and they say, well, if the Holy Spirit is so important, why didn't Jesus start talking about the Holy Spirit before that night? Wouldn't you think he should have? Start preparing them. But for me, as I look at it, this is how I look at it. While Jesus was there with them physically, in the flesh, in person, he was the focus. And it was all about him, and Jesus says, I talk about the Father. I don't do anything unless I see the Father do it. I don't say anything unless I hear the Father say it. So it was all about Jesus. And now Jesus is getting ready to go, and he's shifting the attention to the Holy Spirit because God the Father and God the Son, in agreement with God the Holy Spirit, not some lesser being, not some feeling, not some ooh, but God, God, the Holy Spirit, all three in agreement, come to, this, come to this point. And they say, when God the Son finishes His work on this earth and returns to heaven, we take this new church, these new believers, these who have said, God, we have left Jesus, we've left all to follow you, and we take them and we put them in the hands of the Holy Spirit. And now, 
they're, the Holy Spirit's responsible for them. Now it's the time of the Holy Spirit's work and the development of the church and the expansion of the church and all the work that God has in your life and in my life has been put in the hands of God the Holy Spirit. For me, a lot of times when I talk about the Holy Spirit, I'm careful, I, I, I emphasize often God the Holy Spirit because People have such strange ideas about the Holy Spirit. All sorts of weird, well, it's this and it's that. And sometimes they say it instead of he, and he's God. He's God. And Jesus turns the attention to the Holy Spirit, and here's what he says. And he's just told them, I'm leaving. And he says, I'm going to ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He's the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. You know him because he lives with you now and he later will be in you. So we look at this. For me, when I look at this, you've got, this is the New Living Translation. He says advocate, but I like to go ahead and say four other words which mean exactly this, which are included in this word advocate. So for me, when I say advocate, I'm going to add some other things. I'm also going to say comforter, encourager, counselor, helper. All of those titles, all of those names are included in the advocate. Advocate, comforter, encourager, counselor, helper. And he says, I'm going to ask the Father. So for those of us this morning that have some ideas or some fears about, well, I'm not sure about the Holy Spirit, I want us to see something here. Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give. Who gives the gift of the Holy Spirit? The Father. The Father, not a church, not a person, not a denomination, not some strange whatever. God the Father sends the Holy Spirit. Now look at John 14, 26. But when the Father sends the Advocate, again we see the picture here. Who sends the Holy Spirit? God the Father. But when the Father sends the Advocate, or Comforter, Encourager, Counselor, or Helper, as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, He will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. There's no jealousy between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There's, there isn't. Sometimes we get a little jealous, don't we? We think, well, what about this one? Well, this one's getting more attention than I am. Well, well they're, they're doing more talking than I am. There's no jealousy. There's perfect harmony between God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And we see this beautiful picture. Jesus is sent to earth for God so loved the whole world. We'll look at this at John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten Son. And so God the Father sends Jesus the Son. And as Jesus walks on the earth, he's filled with the Holy Spirit and and then he says, but the Father will send the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, and he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. So the work of the Holy Spirit is in part to remind them and to remind you and me, this is Jesus. This is what Jesus is like. And when the Holy Spirit is given his place in our lives, when the Holy Spirit is given way in the church, he will glorify and he will point to Jesus. It won't be something weird. It won't be something strange. It won't be something out, outlandish. It won't be something um, that scares people. It will be about Jesus. Jesus will be glorified. And so Jesus says, the Father's going to send. And then we look at John 16, 5 through 8. And he says, but now I'm going away to the one who sent me, and not one of you is asking where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it's best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate, the comforter, the encourager, the counselor, the helper, he won't come. I want you to think with me for just a minute. Because they were real people, they had given up everything to follow Jesus, they had given up their jobs. They had given up any sort of position they would have in society and in the synagogue. They had been publicly identified with this Jesus of Nazareth, and they've left it all, so they are sort of outcast in their communities. They're outcast in, their, in the establishment. I don't know if you've ever been an outcast in the establishment before, but that's where they were, and now Jesus says, I'm leaving you. Imagine what they felt like. Imagine what they were thinking. 
wait a minute, Jesus, we have pinned all our hopes on you. Jesus, we've identified with you. If you go, what are we going to do? And he says to them, it's good for you if I go. I'm going to send another one. And we've talked about this before. And when he uses the word another, what it means in the Greek is this. Jesus is saying, I'm going to send you another one like me. That's what it means. That's what it means. So you don't have to be afraid of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's like Jesus. The Holy Spirit's like Jesus. And he says, it's good for me to go away. And if I do go away, then I will send him to you. Ah, so now we find out something else. Not only does the Father send the Holy Spirit, but Jesus is part of the sending as well. And he says, if I go away, then I will send him to you. Look at verse 8, the last, the last sentence. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. Pause there for just a minute. If you'll remember two weeks ago when I talked about where the Holy Spirit intersects our lives, the first thing we talked about was salvation, right? When you and I were born again, not a denomination, but what Jesus says, you must be born again. In other words, you must have life from God that comes into your old life and gives you new life. You must be born again. And this is what Jesus said to a very good man, a very religious man. That's why I can so easily ask every one of you this morning, have you been born again? And you can't say to me, oh, no, 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 I am, uh, well, I am this denomination or I'm that denomination. I'm not asking about your denomination. I'm asking, have you been born again? According to what Jesus said. Because Jesus said to a very good man and a very religious man, you must be born again. And that's the path for every one of us. But I want to pause for just a minute. I want you to think back, those of you this morning who are born again, who are saved, who have new life, who have come into relationship with God, think back to the days or the moments or the hours before you began a relationship with God. What did you feel as you were coming closer and closer to God? Did you feel great? Did you feel, whoa, my life is so good and now I'm going to get God, I'm going to get Jesus also. Was that how you felt? No. How did you feel? Guilty. Guilty. Thank you, Ida. How many of you felt terrible? How many of you felt, I am sinful? How many of you felt, I will never be righteous? How many of you felt, I will never be good enough for God? Guess what? That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And you say, to make me feel awful? If the Holy Spirit will convict us of sin to bring us to Jesus, that's one of the best things he can do in any, 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 any life. I remember the night I truly was born again. I was very, very young. I think I probably, I, I don't remember the exact year, but I remember, I remember that night. I think I was about 11 years old. It was late at night, and I was... I, I started thinking about God and the future and the return of Jesus to the earth. And I had such a terrible gripping in my heart. I knew, oh, if Jesus comes again, I'm not ready to go to heaven. My heart, my life isn't ready. And you may say to me, oh, Sister Jennifer, you were only 11 years old. What did you know? You're 11. I knew enough to know I wasn't ready. And nobody was talking to me. My mother wasn't sit sitting there saying, now Jennifer, be a good girl and you must get saved. Nobody had to talk to me. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was talking to me. And about 11 years old, and I knew I'm not righteous. I knew I won't go to heaven to be with God forever. And that was the night that the Holy Spirit drew my heart to Jesus, to God, for the first time, really for the first time. Oh, I grew up in Sunday school. At 11 years old, I could probably tell you more about the Bible than you know right now. My parents were missionaries. My parents were preachers. My stories at night were not fairy tales. Or, the, or, or Grimm's fairy tales. My stories were from the Bible. I knew about Jonah. I knew about the three Hebrew boys. I knew about Esther. I knew about Joseph. I knew about Paul. I knew about all of them. 
and I could tell and I could tell the stories again I'd grown up in church and grown up in Sunday school but I was not born again and I still remember the work of the Holy Spirit that night as terrible fear gripped my heart and you say oh no no don't let's not talk about fear fear gripped my heart because I knew Jesus if you come tonight I'm not ready but I got ready and I got ready that night and that was the work of the Holy Spirit so we look at this verse when he comes he will convict the world of its sin so those of you I asked what did you feel like as you came to Jesus all oh, most of us most of us had such a terrible feeling in our hearts didn't we when you I'm not good enough oh God if you don't help me oh God if you don't save me I am lost I have no hope unless you help me and that's a good place to be because Jesus is our only hope amen Jesus is our only hope you know I don't usually pastor Renee is usually one that preaches a lot more about salvation um, but I I have been more this has been on my heart more these last these last days um, these last few weeks as well and um, uh, look at John 16 12 through 15 as well He's called the Spirit of Truth. When He comes, He will guide you into all truth. And when the Holy Spirit is in our lives, Jesus knew, I'm going away. And I've been teaching them for three years. Who's going to teach them? Who's going to lead them? The Holy Spirit will. And then we see at the bottom, again, He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me and again we see the work of the Holy Spirit so Jesus began to get them ready he began to get them ready for when the Holy Spirit would come and so the first thing we looked at was the Holy Spirit at conversion without the Holy Spirit's work you and I cannot be born again without the Holy Spirit's work you will never enter the kingdom of God without the Holy Spirit's work you may be a good person you and I may be good church members you and I may be, may do good deeds but we will not have the life of God in us the Holy Spirit has to do that I cannot do that I can tell you about God but I can't make you a Christian only the Holy Spirit can do that I talk with people sometimes who say I don't feel like I'm a Christian and I'm not sure have you ever felt that I don't feel like I'm a Christian let's look at some verses John 3 16 says I, I I yes I prayed I have prayed but I don't know if it really happened I don't feel anything I don't have a tingle there's no glow there's no electricity running through my body oh we look at all sorts of things don't we we really do how many of us do when we feel something who must be God right <laughs> well sometimes God does let us feel things but very often God doesn't let us feel anything at all so what we have to do is look at the Word of God and we see John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life John 1 12 and 13 but to all who believed him have you believed him yes or no yes, yes. have you accepted him yes or no yes. he gave the right to become children of God they are reborn not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan but a birth that comes from God but I'm still not sure Romans 10 9 and 10 if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord have you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead have you believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved okay it doesn't matter how I feel I want to tell you something this morning I'm a pastor I'm a preacher I have been a Christian since the age of 11 you say how many years is that pastor Jenner Jennifer <laughs> many years <laughs> many years more than 40 years more than 40 years but I want to say to you is this sometimes I get up in the morning and I don't feel saved at all 
I don't feel saved. I don't feel special. I don't feel this. I don't feel that. But it doesn't matter because I have believed in my heart and I have confessed with my mouth and I am saved. The Holy Spirit did something in my heart. The Holy Spirit has done something in your life. Whether you feel it or not, if you believed, if you spoke, you are saved. You are saved. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And we look again at this. This is what the Holy Spirit does in, in conversion. So the question is not, have you been baptized? Although you should be baptized if you're a Christian because, because that's what the Word of God says. The question is not, have you joined the church? The question is not, do you, the, although it's good to join churches and to be part of a family, the question is not, have you paid your tithes? Although I think you should pay your tithes. That is one of the ways that God provides uh, for the church and the work of the church and for the support of his servants. All of those things are true and all of those things are good. But God, one day when you get, one day when you stand before God, it's not going to be, did you join a church? Are you a good person? Have you done good deeds? Are you born again? That's the question. Is the life of God in your life? And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. So are you satisfied with your experience in this area? I hope so. You should be. You should be. You should be. And then we looked at the Holy Spirit and, the f and where He intersects our lives in the filling and the filling of the Holy Spirit. And so before his crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus had talked with the disciples about this is what he's going to do when he comes. And then after his resurrection, he was eating with them. It's recorded in Acts 1, 4, and 5. Again, what topic do we have? The Holy Spirit. And he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Pause there again for just a minute. Again, I talk with people sometimes that get all, I'm, I'm scared, well I don't know, well, I'm not sure about this gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a gift from God. It's a gift from God, brothers and sisters. Do you think He's going to give you something bad? Do you think He's going to do something to you that is not good? Do you think he's going to bring something into your life that will cause you harm? The Bible says the Holy Spirit is the gift of the Father. The gift of the Father. And Jesus says, don't leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. You know, there is an American... Uh, I've been out of the U.S. for so, so long now, and I'm trying to remember. I believe it's Master, MasterCard. Uh, the, the credit card, MasterCard. And I think the, the, uh, the ad campaign used to be, don't leave home without it. Um, I, it that's many, have you heard that before? Yes. Is it American Express? <laughs> <laughs> you see how badly advertising works on me? <laughs> American Express. Don't leave home without it. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you something. There's something a lot more valuable and precious and powerful in your lives than the American Express card. <laughs> and that is the Holy Spirit. Don't leave home without Him. And He's talking, and we're kind of laughing about that, but it's true. That's pretty much what Jesus told them, wasn't it? Don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. And then Acts 1.8. Look at this. It's interesting to me. Jesus does not tell them a lot about manifestations or this or that as he's talking with them. It's very simple, isn't it? All he tells them is, the Father and I are going to send a gift. He is important. And he says, but you will, Acts 1-8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. And I find this, leave this up just a minute. Actually, I'm sorry to tell you, this is not a very good translation at this point. I like New Living Translation, but if you have another translation, look at it right now, and you will see that most of the other translations do not say telling people about me everywhere. NIV doesn't say it. Uh, New King James, New American Standard, none of them say telling people about me everywhere. Because when the Holy Spirit 
is poured out in a person's life in this manner as Jesus is talking about, it does not have so much to do with what we say, but it has to do with how we live. The strongest witness, the strongest testimony is not what I say to you, but how I live before you. Amen? Amen. How many of us, we've had people tell us all sorts of things, and yet, mm, look at how they live. Look at what they do. And in your life and in my life and where we go into our workplaces and when we do things, people are going to be looking far more at how you live than at what you say. And so what Jesus said to his disciples and to you and to me is this, but you will receive power and some people get so excited about that. Oh, I want power. <laughs> Jesus says, power to be my witness. So not even so much to do, but it's to be. How am I going to be gentle in a world when I'll tell you something, those of you that know me very well, Sister Gigi can confirm that, that in my heart of hearts, Pastor Jennifer is not really a gentle person. I'm not. That's not me. And those of you that know me well know that that's true. And you know that I sometimes have to come back and say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry, I spoke too strongly. I shouldn't have done that. But the Lord is working on me. And it, the Holy Spirit in our lives comes in primarily and first to give us the power to be what God has called us to be. And the Holy Spirit begins to work in your life. And He begins to work in my life. And how will people know that I belong to God? How will people know that God can make a difference in your life? Because they see my life. And they see that I am changed. And they see that I am transformed. And they see that where once I used to lose my temper and swear and curse when things went wrong. Now the Lord helps me. And I bite my tongue. And I may still get angry, but there's self-control there because the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. It's self-control. Or things that I used to do, I don't do anymore. I've told you before, uh, I've told you before the story of my Chinese auntie in Singapore, uh, the extremely wealthy lady that lived next to us in Singapore that my mother evangelized by, uh, she was married to a, basically she was married to a Malaysian prince. If you want, he, he, or he was a, a lord, if you will. He was a Dato, Dato Tan was his name. And the only reason they lived next to us was they moved to the low rent district because there had been at that time in Singapore many uh, kidnappings of wealthy Chinese people. And so they moved into our neighborhood because nobody in our neighborhood would be kidnapped because we were not rich. And so it was, it was a lower middle class area. So that's why they had moved there. And I've told you the story before about mom began to evangelize uh, her and she began to teach her English from the Gospel of John. What a great place to learn English. And Aunt Sally became a Christian. And she lived a rich and fancy lifestyle, jetting around the world. Parties, they're all on yachts and gambling and drinking and, and, and orgies almost, if you will. That was their lifestyle. That was, that was what their money could buy. That's what their lives were like. And Aunt Sally would go with, uh, uh, with uh, her husband on these trips and she went the first time then she came back and mom said how was it oh it was great it was fine and she was a Christian by this time she went off on another trip and uh, she came back the next time and mom said how was the trip uh, yeah, it was it was okay but it was kind of boring boring jets your own private jet yachts here and there, big parties, champagne, caviar, gambling, this and that. It's kind of boring. She went on another trip with him around the world and mom said, well, how was it, Sally? And Aunt Sally said, to tell you the truth, I just stayed in my room most of the time. I, I, didn't, I didn't want to do that anymore. I, I, really, I just stayed in my room and I was reading my Bible most of the time. Nobody told her Nobody said, you're a Christian now. Your life should be different. But the Holy Spirit was in her. And the Holy Spirit was working. And the Holy Spirit was changing her life. 
the Holy Spirit was changing her life. And that's what the Holy Spirit does when he comes into a life. When the Holy Spirit, and I want to say this to each one of you this morning, because some of you are struggling with some of these issues this morning. You say, I am a Christian, but I'll be honest with you, there are areas of my life that really have not changed very much. There are areas of my life where I'm doing the same things over and over and over again. What I want to say to you is this, not in condemnation, but when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and when we give Him place and room to work and when we invite Him, and when we say and when we mean, Holy Spirit, have your way in my life. Do your work in my life. Oh, do what you came to do. He will do it. He will do it. Because the third place of intersection in our lives with the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit comes day by day by day in your life and in my life when no other Christians are around when I am working in my office when I am arguing with my husband or my wife or as I am disciplining my children or as I'm driving a car through the streets or as I'm trying to make a decision and the world is telling me do this and you'll get ahead. But deep in your heart, you know, but I don't think that's pleasing to the Lord. I think this is what I should do. But if I do this, I'm going to lose out. Other people are going to get ahead. It is in those situations. It is in those times. It is in those moments. When you face what everybody faces, when you face temptations, when you are alone at night and the rest of the family is gone to bed and you're alone in front of your computer and pornography is one click away, this website that you know you shouldn't go to but you're drawn to it or whatever, and you say, well, Pastor Jennifer, you're talking. Yes, these are the things that we face. These are the things that we deal with. And the Holy Spirit is there to change and to help. Look at Ephesians 5. We looked at the other week, we looked at Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. But he says, don't be drunk with wine. And then we talked about this before. I love this expression. Because it will ruin your life. You can't get any, pl that's not very religious sounding, is it? It will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And this be filled means be being filled. It's overflowing. It's overflowing. And some of you are saying, does that mean I can't have a drink? That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm preaching and that's not what I'm teaching this morning. Instead, I'm saying, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. And any issue about drinking or this or that, the Holy Spirit will take care of that. He's holy. He takes care of those things in our lives that we say, well, what about this or what about this? The Holy Spirit can take care of that in your life. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And look at what your life is going to be like. Oh, there will be an overflow of joy. There will be thanksgiving, a life of thanksgiving. And there will be relationships that are made right. Now, I'm going to back up just a little bit and we're going to stop pretty soon. I'm stopping early today, but I'm not stopping yet. Back up a little bit. Ephesians 4, and this is a long passage, but I want us to just look at it very briefly. Ephesians 4, 21 through 30. And we've got, we're going to break it, break it up just a little bit. Paul writes and he says, Since you've heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from Him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. And some of you this morning are going to say, I've tried, but it's so hard. It keeps creeping back. I'm still fighting it. Well, if you live your life as a negative Christian life, you'll never make it. You'll never make it because Christian life is not a series of don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Parents, let me ask you something. Those of you with small children or you've had small children, how many of you feel that sometimes your only conversation with your children is don't? Yeah? Yeah? Don't touch that. Don't do that. 
Don't hit your brother. Don't write on the wall. Don't whatever. Have you ever felt that? Those, those of you, that's what it feels like, doesn't it? And we sometimes we carry that over into our Christian lives as well. And we start acting like a Christian life is all about don't, don't do this, don't do this. Those of you, many of you know my background and my mother and my father's background. Very, very strict background in the U.S. And it was very much, um, there was grace, but there was a very strict, you don't do this, you don't do this, you don't do this, and you don't do this. And for me, uh, growing up, and even before that, I'll tell you some don'ts. Don't get under condemnation now, because I believe that the Christian life is a series of do's instead of don'ts. But in, from my background, it, it was called a Pentecostal or Pentecostal holiness in the 40s and the 50s. Uh, that was before I was born, but you know, back in that. If you were, and my mother told me some of these stories. Ladies, I want you to look at your shoes just a minute. Christians, Christian, good Christian women never showed their toes in church. Okay? Yeah. Anybody, anybody showing your toes in church? I'm showing my toes in, this morning in church. And good, and, and you know what I found out? There were many more don'ts for women than there were for men. Have you found that? Oh, of course, right, Sister Bridget? And... Um, and those of you that are from, especially from a Filipino culture, sorry, Glenda and Amy, but uh, you don't wear something sleeveless to church, right? Ah! Oh. <laughs> okay, Glenda and Amy, no condemnation. <laughs> you do, that Christians don't do that. You, you wouldn't wear sleeveless. How many of you, if, if you're really a good Christian, women, you don't wear bright red lipstick? No, you don't. You've got to be Christian. How many of you, <clears throat> you don't pierce your ears? Do you know that in the 40s and the 50s in the U.S., there were many, many women who became Christians who had pierced ears, and they threw away all their earrings? Because you don't do that if you're a Christian. Oh, you didn't know that. I've got to think of some things for the men, but I can't think of any. <laughs> I can't think of any. Although my dad said if you were a good Christian man, you always wore uh, dark pants and a white shirt with sleeves, and you always wore... Oh, thank you, Tom. And you would never, ever, 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 ever have any tattoos. Ever. Ever, 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 ever. And if you did, you would have them removed when you became a Christian. All sorts of things. All sorts of things. Now, brothers and sisters, I do want to say this. In these air, in these air, and ah, sorry, and you would never, ever, ever go see a movie. Ever. You would never go to a movie. Ever. If Jesus came while you were at the movie theater, <laughs> says, he says, you ain't going to heaven. <laughs> and there are probably, is that, had you ever heard that, Sister Julie? Yes, Sister Jill. Sister and I'll tell you something. Do you know what? To this day, m my father doesn't, doesn't like to go to movie theaters. He's never preached about it. He's never, I've never heard him say, you shouldn't. But that was how he grew up. And so that's just something he just, he just, he just doesn't. Now, I do want to say this. We've joked and laughed about these things. If the Holy Spirit convicts you in one of these areas, then you need to take care of it, okay? You need to take care of it. And I do mean that. I do mean that. Because the Lord knows what for each one of us is a stumbling block. The Lord does know that. And I am not trying to belittle or laugh at anybody's convictions. I'm not. The Lord takes care of these things. But what I do want to say is this. Brothers and sisters, when the Holy Spirit is given His place in our lives, we will know freedom and joy that we have never known before. And if the Holy Spirit deals with something in your life about, get rid of that, you don't need that, it won't be, hmm, 
I want to, but I can't. It won't be that. It will be, oh God, I don't want that in my life. Take it, Lord. Take it. That's fine with me. I don't need that. I don't need that. But where the Spirit of the Lord is, this is what the Bible says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. And there's freedom in the Holy Spirit. And Paul talks, to, talks about the Holy Spirit coming into their lives. And look at this verse right here. Instead, let the, Holy, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. And I love this expression. Let the Holy Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Do you see that? It is not the Holy Spirit will come in and He will beat you over the head and He will say, don't do this and don't do that and you can't have this and you can't have that. No. We open our hearts, we open our lives, we open and we give room to the Holy Spirit, God. We honor Him. We give Him the place that He should have in our lives. And He comes in and He tells us about Jesus and He, and he speaks to us about Jesus and He reveals Jesus in our lives and He will take care of these things just like He did for Aunt Sally who lived the life of a high roller and a partier and a gambler and a who knows what. But the Holy Spirit came in and the Holy Spirit changed her life. And before he passed away, Dato Tan, her husband, who, oh my goodness, had women on every hand and had married Aunt Sally. She was a, a Chinese, she was in Singapore. She was beautiful, a Chinese movie star. <coughs> That's why he'd married her, because she was young and beautiful and famous, and he, he was much, much older. And before he passed away, because of her life, he too became a Christian and, it, and is in heaven today. That's what the Holy Spirit does in our lives, in our hearts. And when we give the Holy Spirit room, let the Holy Spirit renew your thoughts. He won't make you. If you want to continue living the way you're living, you may live that way. But if you say, Holy Spirit, do your work in my life, He will. Let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Look at verse 28 as we come to a close. I really, I, I like this. It's so practical here. When the Holy Spirit begins to work, this is what He does. And one of the verses to me that I, I just laughed as I read it, this is verse 28, and I like, I like what it says. Paul is talking to Christians, and what does he say? If you are a thief, you mean Christians were thieves? Yes, Christians were thieves. In, that, in, the, Roman, in the Roman world of that, of that time, there were those, that's how they made their living. They stole. And Paul says, you're a Christian now. If you're a thief, stop stealing. Use your hands for a good purpose. Use your hands for a good purpose, um, for, for good hard work, and then give generously to others in need. And then he goes on and on and on. And then he says, and don't bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. And we close with that because one of the works of the Holy Spirit this morning is a mark and is a guarantee in your life that one day when Jesus comes again, you will go to heaven to be with him forever. That's what the Holy Spirit does in your life and in my life. Next week when we come back to this, we're going to look at one final thing. And the one final thing we're going to look at is how the Holy Spirit helps us in the times when we are stretched beyond what we can do or when we are placed in a situation and we think, I don't know how to do this. For example, and we'll talk about this next week, Edmund and Kathy, this is the preview, Edmund and Kathy a few days ago sent me an email, a text, and they said, Pastor Jen, there's someone who's dying and we want to share God with him. What do we do and how do we do it? It scared you, didn't it? It's a big responsibility, isn't it? It's more than you can do, isn't it? But it's not more than the Holy Spirit can do. And as we pray, and as we're in situations where it is beyond ourselves, 
that's when the Holy Spirit comes in to do what we cannot do. That's his work. And we'll look at that next week. But let's close in prayer this morning. And I just want to, I want to encourage you this morning. We've laughed about some things. Please don't go out, go home and throw all of your, your, your open shoes from the closet. <laughs> or your earrings. Unless the Holy Spirit tells you to. But the Holy Spirit does care how we live. He cares how we think. He cares what we say. He cares about what we do with our hands. He cares about how we treat our brothers and our sisters and our husbands and our wives and our children and our employees and our bosses. And he has come to renew us and make us like Jesus. And we will be his witnesses. Lord, we your people come again before you this morning. And Father, we are so grateful that our life with you is not a series of don't, 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 don't. But instead, because of the Holy Spirit, we have freedom. We have freedom in you, and we're so grateful. But Lord, we also ask that as your Holy Spirit does his work in our lives and in our hearts, that he would indeed do the work that is needed, that he would continue to make us like Jesus. We don't want to resist the work of the Spirit in our lives. We don't want to be afraid, oh God, of your gift of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we don't want to be resistant, but Lord, we want to give honor and place to the one that was sent to lead us into truth, to lead us into righteousness, to make us holy, to make us witnesses, our advocate, our counselor, our helper, our teacher, our counselor, our comforter. Have your way, have your place in our lives this week, we pray, in the day-to-day, -day, in the temptations, in the decisions, in the things that we face, in the, in the areas where we struggle, Holy Spirit, oh please, oh please, renew us and restore us and make us like Jesus. Do what we cannot do in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.